So what I wanted to do is sort of bracket uh, the research that we're going to be talking about, the project that we're going to be talking about in time and space and give a little bit of history as to how we ended up in this part of New Mexico. So the talk is entitled Preservation Archaeology in the Land of Enchantment. And while ideally we'd be working in all of New Mexico, the project that, uh, that we're going to be talking about tonight is just a small chunk of that. So we're going to be talking primarily about uh, the past five years of work by uh, per, uh, personnel at the center in the area of the Upper Gila. So when I say the Upper Gila, I'm really talking about the headwaters of the Gila River above Safford in that area of New Mexico, uh, the Silver City, uh, uh, Silver City vicinity, and this area of southwestern New Mexico that is pretty mountainous. Uh, the cultural uh, affiliation of the area is it, it's, it's what we think of as the Mimbris area. That's sort of what it's most well known for in terms of archaeology. And that's the area that we've been concentrating uh, for the past five years. And we got there through a sort of a variety of, uh, uh, for a variety of reasons. When I came on board at the center, we had just received some funding to work in this upper Gila as a rather natural extension of a very long-term program at the center, working along the Gila and studying issues in late prehistory. So you got a lot of you are familiar with the work that we've done along the San Pedro River. The person who was in my position previously um, did work a lot in the, uh, in the Safford area and the area around Bonita Creek. And so we, in many ways, we've sort of been moving up the Gila River. And this area of the upper Gila was the net, the, you know, was naturally recommended itself for a variety of reasons. Um, the Coalescent Communities Database, which is a project that the center has been heavily involved with, identified this small area of western New Mexico as one of the only places in the entire southwest where in the period between about 1350 and 1450, where we actually saw what looked like population increase at a time when lots of the Southwest is shedding population. People are uh, moving, they're shifting lifestyles into, uh, into things that don't leave lots of archeological remains. People are becoming harder to see in the landscape. But this area of southwestern New Mexico is a place where large sites were being constructed at a time when lots of the southwest is, uh, is dispersing. So from a research perspective, it's a really interesting area. Um, the other, some of the other things that recommend this, the area are the, one of the strengths of the kind of work that we do in going in and working with private landowners is that Large chunks of the Southwest are public land and preservation laws, laws that protect sites from looting, laws that, uh, that demand the inventory and uh, evaluation of sites reach very well onto public lands, federal lands, state lands, even in places like Pima County, county lands uh, are, very, are fairly well served by preservation laws. Unfortunately, private land doesn't have that kind of protection in most of the Southwest. There are some laws that, you know, that uh, restrict what you can do in terms of mechanical excavation. There's some laws concerning burials, but by and large, private land uh, isn't well served by preservation laws. If, if there's a site on private land, it is almost by definition at some kind of risk because these a lot of the federal and state laws don't apply. So. In the upper Gila and in, in a lot of parts of the southeast, especially, and in some parts of the southwest, including the upper Gila, the, land, the history of Anglo settlement in the land has meant that these areas right along the riversides have always been private land. So if you're a corn farmer, if you are someone coming up out of uh, the southern southwest or coming down from the plateau and you're making an attempt at growing corn, the areas that you're going to settle in are the places that are best watered. Those are the same areas that you're going to settle in if you are uh, a homesteader, an Anglo homesteader, or, uh, or a Spanish or Mexican homesteader coming to the area. Those are the areas that have always been private land, which means that a disproportionate number of the sites of interest in late prehistory, when we're talking about relatively sedentary villages who are subsisting 
largely on agriculture, most of those sites are on private land in this part of the country, which means that uh, this area suffered from a dearth of survey coverage. We don't have a whole lot of good survey, although there's some excellent survey that was done by the Members Foundation, especially in the Members Valley and in other parts of, uh, of the Upper Gila. And that the amount of archaeological work that had been done as a result of uh, contract archaeology of compliance work was relatively low. So a lot of the sites of interest to archaeologists in this area are located on private land. So the combination of this, this clearly interesting archaeological pattern of population growth in this area in the 1350s and the relative scarcity of data in the area. I mean, there were a handful of sites that had been excavated um, that dated to the post mimbrous era. Uh, as a researcher and as someone interested in this, the, the process of late prehistory and what, you know, what archaeologists gloss as the Salado and this period of you know, post-1325 change that's sweeping across the Southwest, this is a really great area for, for me as a graduate student to be, wanted, to, to be interested in. Unfortunately, that challenge of having to work with landowners, I think has meant that there's a lot less work done in this area than what could have been done. So that was the, those were the basic preconditions that, that led us into the area. Now, through a, through a series of sort of lucky chance, um, Bill and I were lucky enough to be, uh, to be introduced to one of the local land er owners in a place called Mule Creek, New Mexico. Uh, and we were able to start a conversation with a guy who had a site on his land. That site had been, had had a basic survey done in, I believe, the late 70s, and then had had a little bit of work done by uh, the Muggy Owned Prehistoric Landscapes Project out of ASU. So there was a little bit of information known about the, uh, what's called the Three Up site in Mule Creek, New Mexico. So through this initial set of conversations with the landowner, uh, he expressed a willingness to allow us to come out and do a little bit of research on this site that was really fairly unique in the area. Most of these, these late uh, 1300 sites hadn't been investigated and we were fortunate enough to find, uh, because, of, uh, because of a family connection of his to a graduate student at ASU, uh, to open up this opportunity to come into the site and do a little bit of work. So our initial work there in uh, Mule Creek in, uh, I believe, 2008, so it's, it, it's been a while, uh, opened up additional doorways. So while we're there in the community doing the excavation work, um, I saw it as my role and several of us at the center saw it as our role to try and to uh, go and do outreach to meet the members of the community, to talk about what we were doing and why we were there. And that set the stage for what has become a five-year project and what we hope will continue. So the start of this research was to inventory the sites in the upper Gila. What are the sites of interest to us as researchers? So this is something that myself and colleagues at the Center for Desert Archaeology did, we sat down and looked at what sites had been recorded in the Upper Gila. And we were able to make an inventory. A lot of these sites were excavated 20, 30, 40 years ago. A lot of them had been excavated or recorded by amateur archaeologists. So these are people with enthusiasm and uh, the means to go out and excavate these sites, but not necessarily the latest training in terms of um, archaeological excavation and recording techniques. Um, so we had a lot of gray literature, we had a lot of partially excavated sites, and we had a sort of a handful of sites that we could target as sites of interest. The initial uh, opening that we saw there in Mule Creek at the Three Up site uh, was only one part of the strategy. We wanted to be sure to, to we, we wanted to get on the ground and do some very limited uh, excavation, some additional survey work, some groundwork to see what sort of patterns we were seeing on the ground. But from the beginning, we knew that in getting into this area, a lot of what we were gonna end up doing was archival research, was research in collections, 
you know, the, the notion of preservation archaeology is not that you go in and dig big holes in sites. So we, uh, from the beginning, the plan was to supplement collections-based data and publish data with some small additional amount of work on the ground. And from the beginning of the project in uh, 2008 and even before, the conversation wasn't about what sites do, reach, do we as researchers need to dig holes in to sort out. The conversation had to do with what are the important sites in the upper Gila? What are their status? Uh, and how can we, as responsible researchers, get the inf information we need to know to advance our research agenda while incorporating elements of outreach and preservation such that we leave the upper Gila better than we found it? Um, and I think Andy wanted to talk about this uh, at this level. When we come in with a, a, an inventory of sites that are important to us as researchers, um, that's, that's, e that's relatively easy for me to do. You know, I can, I can look at the sites, look at the sites that have data, look at the sites that look like they have the levels of population or the ceramic assemblage to be interesting to me as a researcher. But the, the next step in preserving these sites or in thinking about them in, in the long term is who owns these sites? What, are, what th sites are more threatened than others? What sites are gone? Because frankly, in the, in the interval between the recording of these sites and the kinds of revisits that we've been lucky enough to do, a lot of them have been, have been pretty heavily impacted. So one of the things that we've tried to do is incorporate uh, site preservation and, uh, and preservation planning into the entire scope of this research uh, agenda. And uh, that's, I think, where Andy comes in. Yeah, I think what Rob talks about is essentially having a list and sort of the real value for me because when I first started, um, they would already begun their work in the uh, Upper Gila area, is that there was literally a list to work off of. And uh, the kind of work that I'm doing, which, you know, expressed most simply, is securing long-term protection for prehistoric and rural historic sites here in the Southwest. Um, it's important to figure out what are we going after because there is a lot of archaeological sites as I'm sure all of you are aware and so at some sort of fundamental level you have to kind of get it down to a manageable list of important places to work and presumably that'll be informed by experts so we were able to use that list to begin to do sort of the somewhat tedious but nonetheless important work of figuring out where these sites were, who the landowners were, and beginning the very first step of the process, which is developing landowner relationships. Um, I think in some respects, the upper Gila, because the research program wasn't as mature, um, did, hasn't wor hasn't, uh, isn't as well positioned as, say, our work in the San Pedro. And by that, I mean in the San Pedro, the center had inv been involved since the early 90s, if not before. And there, there was a long history of landowner relationships that were developed principally through the research work that the center has been doing. And from my point of view, the best way to enter the conversation with landowners is through the relationships that could develop through the research arm. And the reason I say that is much of my work is focused on talking to landowners about the long-term use and disposition of their property. And that's not an easy conversation to have with people. It may not be a conversation they particularly want to have because it's something they really necessarily don't want to think about at that moment in time. I think for a lot of people, particularly in rural areas, it brings up lots of implications about their use of their property. And so it's much better to be able to begin that conversation with people where there's already an ongoing relationship that was really done through, in many ways, a more neutral topic like research, which you know I think people at some base level have a lot of interest in. They know these places are on their property. They're kind of curious and they like the idea that they're special and that people who have professional expertise are there to learn more and share that. And so um, on the upper Gila, you know, is more about trying to make that introduction in essentially in advance of the research that had been ongoing. But nonetheless, um, it's not always a difficult conversation by any means. Landowners are very varied in their um, attitudes towards the conversation. 
But I think the core thing that you know, I wanted to talk about is the notion of developing a list, which, as Bill mentioned, I've worked in the environmental uh, natural conservation world, and very much uh, part of that has been priority setting, where organizations like the Nature Conservancy and various land trusts have approached the issue of the planet Earth, we're losing important pieces of the natural world, so if we go about trying to protect pieces, what pieces do we need to protect? And so I think the idea was to apply that similar level of thinking to the cultural resource world. And to a certain extent, I don't think there's been as extensive as a conversation on that, that uh, plane in the cultural preservation world as in the natural resource conservation world. And so a little bit of it has been sort of feeling our way. It's sort of taking some of the um, techniques and tools that maybe have been used in the natural areas world and seeing how they might apply in the cultural resources world. Uh, some of the work has been done. Pima County was, I think, in the lead on this through the Sonoran Desert Conservation Plan, where they did a cultural resources priority planning exercise. And so in some ways, we were building on that. And that's what we've been seeking to replicate. Uh, in the upper Gila, we started with this list generated by the researchers, and essentially we're building on that. Um, our model was essentially what we've done in the San Pedro, where we had 20 plus years of experience. We had in-house people that knew the San Pedro, at least the lower San Pedro, extremely well from an archaeological perspective. And essentially through a combination of those data sets, um, along with expert input, we were able to start drawing circles around areas on the landscape. And on your table are an example of that map in the San Pedro. And essentially what we end up with is a priority areas list of places to work. So we can become proactive about engaging landowners about the resources on their land. And that's an important dimension of it because I think in a lot of things in life, um, it's often reactive. An event happens and you react to it. And what the lesson learned in the natural areas conservation world is that while there are laws in place like the Endangered Species Act, the National Environmental Policy Act, or even the National Historic Preservation Act, when you're always in that reactive mode, you're already behind the eight ball. And so what's really important is to kind of get out in front of that train. And so one of the things we've been really putting some emphasis on is on developing priority areas so we begin to focus our efforts down into the specific places that we place the most importance on. And that importance, again, is generated by experts. And, and those experts aren't necessarily resident in the center by any means. Um, another example is we've taken the work in the San Pedro and we've expanded that to Pinal County where the Planning uh, Development Services Department as part of their comprehensive land use plan um, as a cultural resources element in the plan, which seeks to preserve cultural resources in the county. And one dimension of that was to develop a list of priority sites. And so we were able to um, organize both tribal uh, people as well as academic experts into a setting where we again combine data using these new spatial technique technologies, which aren't so new anymore, and uh, using expert opinion, we came up again with a list of areas where we were able to draw lines around, where we were saying this is where the really important stuff is. And so presumably the county can begin tailoring some of their land use planning efforts with at least some uh, deference to those cultural resources. And we're essentially doing the same thing in, in by identifying specific parcels of land owned by people where they are, occur in these priority areas. And that's how we begin going about our business of developing landowner relationships and having a conversation about how these sites can be protected long term. You know, I, I wanted to back up a second though, that kind of got us into the nuts and bolts of things. And uh, part of the talk today was not only to talk about the, you know, what we do or where we work, but also why we work. And, you know, there's an open question I think is why are we protecting these sites? And for me, when I first came in, I, I thought it was a fairly straightforward uh, kind of proposition, at least from my personal perspective. But I think it's a little more nuanced than that. And, uh, you know, I wanted to just throw out some perspectives here this evening. I think one of them that everyone in the room would certainly appreciate is that we protect these sites for their long-term research value that helps us better understand how people lived on the land here in the Southwest. And as we've developed new technologies, 
as we develop new intellectual frameworks, um, it would be important to have sites where we can continue to collect data in the context of these new technologies and intellectual frameworks. And that can only be accomplished if we undertake our current research in a more limited way, and we, as Rob has explained, and also that these sites are available by protecting them. Whether you're buying them, in the case of uh, some of the sites we own, whether you're securing development rights, or whether you're just maintaining good positive relationships with landowners so they continue to do the right thing. So that's one obvious area. Um, a second area clearly has to do with the way these sites help people better understand uh, what's out there on the land and develop a better appreciation for the cultural resources that we have. Of course, many sites really don't lend themselves to that for a variety of reasons. Maybe the trace on the land is subtle. Uh, maybe the land really isn't in a park kind of environment where you can more easily interpret it. But nonetheless, I think we hold out the option that protecting these sites long term holds out that option for education and outreach. I think the last one is the most intriguing to me because it has to do with how this gives us a sense of place. Um, I think there's always been a strong connection between people and the land as well as the things they build on the land. And I think it's the core of historic preservation, it's at the core of natural area preservation. And I think to the extent to which we continue to have these places on the land, people develop a stronger connection with the land. People, a lot of people in rural areas already have it. And these archaeological sites are very much a part of the mix of how they identify these places. Because just like them, these were people living and working on the land. And so I think there's a, a natural kind of affinity to these resources for people that own them and work a rural landscape. Um, I think the interesting part of the equation for me, though, has been, um, you know, when we think about protecting these sites and I th we think about cultural resource preservation, um, archaeologists have been, up until recently, almost the sole broker of this resource. And to a certain extent, that's understandable because without archaeologists, there's no one there to translate, in a sense, what these resources are and what they mean. And so, um, you know, it's a pretty uh, understandable relationship. But I think to a certain extent, it's been a fairly exclusive relationship. And I'm speaking as someone who works um, and has always been outside the archaeology community. As Bill said, I'm a biologist. I'm not an archaeologist or a cultural resource person. I think, you know, within the last maybe decade or two, I think part of that conversation has had to include Native Americans to a much greater degree. And I think as I've learned, and some of you may uh, know from direct experience, you know, that's been an interesting relationship that's evolved. I think that Native Americans, through laws and other means, have sort of forced themselves to the table, and archaeologists have been forced in some ways to essentially engage the Native American in this resource. And up until then, I don't think Native American input was really given maybe the credence that it needed. Um, I think the next frontier, and I'm speaking personally again, is that there is another larger group of stakeholders outside the Native Americans, and it's people like me, and presumably a lot of people like you, and kind of what the resource means to us. And um, how do we broaden that conversation? Because I think fundamentally, um, cultural resources are experiential. I mean, it's wonderful to have reports and to go to presentations like this, but I think we would all agree there's nothing like being in the presence of these cultural resources and having some learned perspective on it. I mean, to visit Mesa Verde, to visit Casa Grande Ruins National Monument, and for me to go out in some fairly remote areas and suddenly begin to see on the landscape things that I must have hiked over a hundred times, and they're right there. I mean, I had this wonderful experience out in the east side of the Tortolita Mountains, all on state trust land, where, you know, you hit a one-room structure with a trash mound and agricultural terraces with rock piles and diversion dams. You go up to a slope and you see terraced fields. You go down the slope, you see petroglyphs with the, circle, the uh, spiral. You go a little farther, you see a room block. You see a compound wall room block. I mean, suddenly you realize you're in the presence of a complete cultural landscape, just sitting there on the land. And um, I think one thing that challenges us all is how does that experience brought to more people? I mean, clearly by talks and virtual reality and some of those things, it's a way to reach people. But I think there's a challenge for us to think about how people can really experience it the way I have. 
which you know I feel quite fortunate, quite frankly, to be able to go out there and like I said, five years ago, I probably hiked over these things and didn't have a clue. And suddenly with a little bit of insight, you know, with people like Valerie and Sherry Fre uh, Freeman with me, I was able to see these things. And so that's, I think, the next sort of uh, frontier, and it's part of why, you know, I think we're involved with protecting sites, is to sort of broaden the conversation and continue to think about how we can engage more of the public in the importance of the resource and, and why we need to protect it. So, as Bill mentioned, I'm a graduate student at U of A. And one of the things that I can tell you about graduate school is that the model that we're given for how archaeologists think about sites and how archaeologists view research and how archaeologists talk to the public or engage with the public about sites is absolutely inadequate <clears throat> to the task at hand. If I... You know, we are sort of trained on a time, there, there are several issues that Andy brought up that I want to cover. One is timing and uh, tempo and how long these projects take. Another is broadening the stakeholder groups. Uh, and a third is how we bring this, how we make this experience important, this experience uh, of understanding the past how we make that important to other people. So I'm going to try and sort of touch on each of those individually. The cycle that research, that academics and archaeologists engaged in uh, a lot, lot of kind, uh, a lot of research, including contract projects, the pace at which those projects work, the grant cycle, the project deadline, the 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 deadline for compliance work, is absolutely inadequate to get to know the people on the ground who are likely to really care about these resources. One of the things that Andy mentioned is that the center has spent you know, 10, 15, 20 years in the San Pedro. And the reason that we've been able to be so effective there in land preservation is that we've been there for so long. You, you build these interpersonal relationships and these things, this, this coming to know the community and coming to know the stakeholders and in some ways more importantly letting them know you and letting them get to know what you care about is as important uh, as anything else that we do and the the typical grant cycle the typical one year two year even three year uh, NSF turnaround and the rate at which we're we're encouraged to engage with these sites is really very, very limited. Every year that I spend at Mule Creek, I have gotten the opportunity to sit down and talk with additional landowners. At this point, I'm known at the post office. I'm known when I drive my truck down the road to, to, to get gas at, in Cliff, which is the nearest gas station. Mule Creek's very small. Um, and I think that we have traditionally underestimated the, the degree to which building that kind of trust benefits us even just as researchers, not necessarily as people who want to preserve these sites in perpetuity, although that's certainly my goal, but just as researchers, the ability to build a rapport with landowners that allows you to talk to them. These, these are, in Western New Mexico, we're talking about ranchers. These guys know their land. They spend a ton of time out on their land. We could not possibly fund archaeologists to spend as much time on their land as these guys have. So in general, we need to be treating these landowners as resources. In order to do that, we have to explain to them in no uncertain terms what we're interested in. Um, I have done a tremendous amount over the past five years of talking about preservation laws and preservation goals and archaeological goals, explaining that, no, in fact, if you tell me as an archaeologist that you have a site on your land, I do not really have the ability to let the federal government come in and take your land. That's a, that, I mean, it, it, it sounds almost silly that, you know, oh, you have a site on your land, we're going to take your ranch. People legitimately believe that. Yeah. And they legitimately believe that not because they're poorly informed, but because we as archaeologists have done a pretty poor job 
of explaining why we're out there on their land, what we're looking for, the fact that we're not out there digging for gold, the fact that we can accomplish a tremendous amount by without ever putting a shovel in the ground. The kinds of archaeological research that I think uh, my generation of archaeologists see as very, very, very productive, which are the kinds of large-scale databases that locate sites on the landscape, that give them temporal ranges, that talk about the material culture on those sites. Things like the Coalescent Communities Database or the Southwest Social Networks Project that's going on at the U of A. These depend on large data sets and lots of good survey coverage. They don't necessarily depend on us going out and digging up individual rooms. We don't have to have that kind of data to be able to address really interesting questions. So getting to the point where you're, you have a relationship with a landowner such that he trusts you to come out on his land and will tell you where the sites are, may be all that you need. You, you, gain, you can gain a tremendous amount of data by just locating sites on the landscape. But I think that because of the difficulties in working with private landowners, because of the, the amount of time it takes in a lot of these small rural communities that are not necessarily interested in folks from the university or from the government coming in and walking around in their land, that kind of data has, I think, been uh, an untapped resource. And it's not just a matter of tricking these people onto, into letting us out on their land. I honestly, I, I understand their perspective. Why should they let us come out? What's the point? Why should they let me come out and record sites on their land? It's my job and it's our job as archaeologists to relate this story of prehistory and relate the importance of these places on the landscape to people out there in the community. They're ultimately going to be way more connected to sites on their land than we are. And enlisting them in our efforts, I think, is a much, much better uh, model than sort of going out, taking the data we need, and leaving. And Andy and I have both heard stories from people at just you know, sitting and talking over a fence or sitting at a kitchen table and chatting, people have said to, to both of us, oh yeah, we, you know, we have a site on our land, we let a guy come out, they, they came out, they did some work, they disappeared, and then two years later we got a, we got a dissertation, you know, or we got, a, we got a project report. Well, honestly, you guys have read gray literature, you guys have read dissertations. That's not the sort of thing that's going to get your average person stoked about the, the, the history that they're involved in. I mean, you know, I'm writing my dissertation right now. I can barely read it. So the reality is, is that the extent to which we can change how we think about preservation, it's not just so that we can continue to do research. We've got to enlist these people in, in thinking about the past and in actively caring about the sites on their land, that's the surest path to getting these sites preserved. We're not going to get all sites preserved, but building those relationships and spending time with people, talking to them about archaeology, talking to them about the past, talking to them about the fact that we're not there to take their land, frankly, is the kind of on-the-ground work that grad school didn't prepare me for but that has been a very, very, very interesting and educational part of this whole process. I mean, we've spent five years there, and I, I, I'm, I'm being quite serious. Every year I go back, a few more people in the community say, oh yeah, I've seen that guy driving around here for five, six years. He's got the, you know, he's got the recommendation of these two or three people in the community. That guy that I trust let him on the land. And, uh, you know, and, and maybe we'll, we'll be able to sit down and have a conversation with them. Um, this, it's also been a very interesting sort of a negotiation. You have, to, you have to know who in the community, you know, you can talk to, who in the community. I mean, we've had, we've had people in the community identify looters to us and say, these are people you don't want to talk to. These people are actively digging up sites. And that kind of information, I think, cannot be achieved in a one-year research project in a two-year research project. In the traditional kind of project where you identify the site, you send archaeologists to the site, they excavate some small portion of the site, they record their data, they leave, they crunch their data, and maybe they send a report to the rancher. 
that model, I think, is ultimately unsustainable. And one of the things that, that we've been lucky enough to, to do in the San Pedro, or in the, in the Upper Gila is to begin. I would say that our five years is a good start to introducing the Center for Desert Archaeology to the community, introducing this concept of preservation archaeology to the community, getting, uh, you know, getting the word out. And that's a timing issue, and that's a fundamental structural problem in how we think about archaeology that, that in my view, we're going to have to change. Um, yeah. Well, I think the landowner relationship thing that Rob talks about is really sort of fundamental to the whole essence of the discussion we're trying to have. And it really does point to the fact that it's not easy work. Um, but the other interesting aspect of it, and to, to maybe transition back to the upper Gila, is that um, there's a need for a lot of tools. And so part of what we do is, you know, how do we do long-term protection? And sometimes it really is just a, man, man, um, just a means to just establish regular landowner communication. For example, a lot of sites are actually owned by the Nature Conservancy. They've invested a lot of money protecting riparian areas in the southwest. And as Rob pointed out earlier, a lot of those lands right adjoining the riparian areas were the habitation sites for prehistoric people. So by no design of theirs, they own probably more cultural resource sites than any other organization, including the Archaeological Conservancy. Well, they're predisposed to land conservation. They're not necessarily predisposed to cultural resource preservation. But again, they're not likely to do something specifically to impact a cultural resource if they're aware of it. And so part of our job becomes simply developing a mechanism to have regular contact. We're only talking maybe once or twice a year to let people know there's the resource. Can we go out and check up on it? They have changes in personnel. They're not going to be advising their personnel on the cultural resources necessarily on the land. That's sort of our job. So for a lot of properties, sometimes it really is just developing sort of what I would call the institutional infrastructure to have that kind of regular landowner contact. In Arizona and New Mexico, we have lots of state trust lands. And I don't know how familiar all of you are with state trust lands, but they're this weird sort of public-private kind of land concept. Um, it's not really public land. It's not a public trust doctrine. It's a trust doctrine that requires fiduciary responsibility, which means highest and best use. Highest and best use doesn't necessarily include cultural resources. However, these lands aren't being sold out from unders at a rapid clip. And so they're kind of in this gray zone. They're not really private. They're not really public. Well, that's where site stewards come in. You know, having people out on the land on a regular basis, monitoring, so we at least are aware of what sites are receiving maybe frequent vandalism or looting pressure. Um, it's a way to alert authorities about that. It's a way to inform the local rancher who may be leasing the land. So it's a communication strategy. It isn't necessarily like we're going to go out and own or control this land. We're just going to somehow develop means to provide for regular monitoring and communication with the landowner. In other instances, it is working directly with the landowner, sometimes to buy the land. Most people own their land and they consider it a financial asset. They may be, may be the best well-meaning people in the world, but the reality is it's a part of their financial asset base. They're not particularly wealthy people, and so they don't have the luxury of just protecting the site without some financial remuneration. So in those instances, sometimes you can work out essentially a fair market value transaction. We have money, we can pay them money, and we now own the site. We don't have much money, so there isn't much we can do about that. But, you know, conceptually, though, I think that's one of the mechanisms we use. And in fact, we do have several pieces of land. Um, the other tool is conservation easements. People don't necessarily want to sell their land, but they essentially want to see some long-term preservation particularly people in rural areas, they may have a strong personal heritage connection to the land that has to do with their families and the fact that they've worked these lands for generations. Cultural resources are part of the mix because maybe their grandfather first took them out to see a site when they were two, and now here they are and they own the ranch. And so they would like to find ways in which to protect things long term. They don't want to sell it. They want the land to stay in it as a working ranch. They don't want the government or a nonprofit that's not going to work the land to own it because the working part of it is a very much a part of that heritage. 
And so conservation easements are a tool where you essentially strip some of the uses off the land that would be detrimental to the cultural resources, for example. Um, there's a financial value associated with stripping those uses from the land, and they can donate them and receive a charitable contribution. Um, or you can buy them. We like them to donate it, but you know, sometimes you have to buy them. But I think, again, if there's sort of a mix of strategies that you use to essentially accomplish your objective, which is essentially providing long-term protection for some of these resources. The, the one point I would like to sort of conclude with, though, is, um, is just sort of talking a little bit about what I call the preservation infrastructure as it exists. And a sort of another sort of eye-opening part of working this job is uh, coming to appreciate the fact that um, cultural resources are really way behind natural resources in terms of generating the um, financial resources, the people, to help protect these places. Um, it, it's interesting to think about why. I mean, we could certainly speculate. But I mean, the reality is that cultural resources don't have anywhere near the government programs that are there to protect natural resources. Um, there is no preservation community that's actively engaged in the dialogue. Um, I can't tell you, you know, public lands management, there's a large public lands environment out there. There's not a lot of people at the table who are advocating on behalf of cultural resources. There are lots of people at the table advocating on behalf of natural resources. Um, so, you know, there's, there's a real sort of disparity, I think, that I think collectively we should think about. You know, why, why is that? You know, Section 106 is an interesting law, the National Historic Preservation Act. There's a consultation process that occurs about historic resources in a project area. Interested parties um, can become part of that process of consultation. In some ways, that far exceeds what's available to people on the natural resource side of the equation. You know, I'm very familiar with those laws like the Endangered Species Act or the National Environmental Policy Act. It doesn't give you such a upfront seat at the table, quite frankly, as the National Historic Preservation Act. I'm, I'm sorry to say there's not a lot of interested parties taking advantage of that. There's the SHPO offices and there's the project proponents, but there's not this sort of advocacy community, whether it's individuals or organizations who are taking advantage of it. So, you know, I think there's just this fantastic opportunity to, for people to engage more about the historic resources that's really just codified in law and just doesn't seem to be happening. And so um, I think that's, you know, one note I'd like to leave uh, with people is that, um, you know, for uh, many reasons, some of which aren't necessarily apparent, um, that kind of advocacy on behalf of cultural resources is kind of missing out there. There's a whole infrastructure that I think we, we continue to have to build. And you know, it needs to start with people like you. I think the organization that I work for is certainly taking a stab at it as well. But we exist only with your support, and uh, not only your financial support, but your actual you know, commitment to the resource. And so you know, I'd encourage you to figure out ways to get more involved. You know? And some of you are, I know, with site stewarding and things like that. So I don't mean to suggest that people aren't involved. But I think there's a whole yet another part of the equation that you know, needs help. And it all reflects back on the kind of work that I'm doing, which is ultimately without that broad base of support and effort, you know, protecting these resources is a challenge. Because we really don't have the time that it's really needed like Rob talks about. I mean, in the ideal and in some communities, we will go in and build that broad base of support and undertake those painstaking you know, time consumptive relationship buildings with landowners. We've done that in the San Pedro. We hope to do that in the upper Gila. But that takes staff. It takes a long-term view. And in the meantime, a lot of these resources are going under. So, you know, we need to take full advantage of all the tools out there and the involvement by the interested uh, constituencies. What, what I absolutely, can you hear me? What I absolutely love about working at the center is to get to fraternize and talk and interact with people like this with intelligence and passion on a daily basis. So now is your opportunity to ask them questions and uh, raise your hand and I'll bring you the microphone. And uh, someone want to begin? <laughs> 
We're easy, I promise. Thank you. Um, can you tell us some of the stories that uh, you encountered dealing with uh, landowners? Sure. <laughs> you mean the good stories or the bad stories? <laughs> Don't mention names, though, if you have good yeah. stories. Right. Well, um, one of the stories I like to tell most recently is um, you may all be aware, or some of you are at least aware, is that we essentially receive land from the Members Foundation in the Members Valley. There were two properties that the Members Foundation held in fee and a conservation easement they held over the Maddox Ruin site. Um, as a result of the work we've just talked about in the Members Valley, we learned that the Members Foundation held some of these lands, that the Members Foundation wasn't particularly active. Bill talked to Steve LeBlanc, and long story short, the Members Foundation thought that long term, these properties best resided with us. Well, in terms of doing the background research on those properties, um, there were three Solato sites in the Members Valley that Roger Anion and Steve did research on. Um, one of them was Jantz, which the Members Foundation bought and which we now own. Another one was called Staley. It was a small 10-room site. And there was another one called Dicer. Well, Staley, I was, you know, where I was trying to run down, okay, there's the Jantz site. We know all about that. What about Dicer and Staley? So I did the land ownership records, and sure enough, you know, I find this little parcel in the vicinity of the Staley site, and the guy that owns it is called Staley. So I figured out it's probably the Staley site there. <laughs> so I went and visited the Staley site. The guy that owns it is Gene Staley. He's about 80 years old. He um, was really happy to see me, and he took me out in the back of his, like, he's got three acres, and the back, the back acre, there's a little mound on the ground. That is the Staley site, a 10-room Salado site. I think they excavated two rooms in the Members Foundation. He's never touched it since. He's extremely proud of the site. And he basically said, you know, ever since then, I've had several neighbors approach me that like to stick a shovel in there. But my attitude is, you know, I don't want people sort of sticking a shovel in my ancestors' graves. So I don't want people sticking a shovel in there. And, you know, it was this really great kind of experience to realize that you know, there was no landowner relationship cultivation. I mean, really, ever since Steve and Roger were out there, he hadn't had a visit. And it was almost 40 years later, and this man, to this day, continued to recognize that he had something of importance, that he didn't think it should be subject to just someone going in there with a shovel and a pickaxe, and he just protected it. And, uh, you know, I took a picture of him on the mound, and <laughs> it was just great. Now, you know, ultimately what's going to happen, I don't know, but it's clearly under his stewardship, um, it was well protected. And he's got a wife who's younger than him, so I think his presumption is, is that he'll probably pass first, and then he'll, it'll be to his wife to figure it out. But, you know, I met his wife, and she understood what her husband's feelings were about the site, so, you know, we could get lucky, and ultimately that site will be protected. It's certainly been protected for 40 years. Yeah. I, have a, I have another small story. Uh, so my... Research involves the sourcing of obsidian, uh, which is really common in the Mule Creek area. And, uh, you know, to, I could seriously keep you all here forever talking about it, but I'm not going to do that. Um, the, obsidian, the, the baseline obsidian work, ke chemically characterizing the obsidian that shows up in Mule Creek, was done by uh, Dr. Steve Shackley, who was here. Um, not too long ago for uh, uh, an archaeology cafe, and he long ago related this story to me about when he was originally out there, sort of in the 80s and the 90s, trying to get permission to go on these people's land and pick up rocks and take them back to his lab and source them. So he, you know, so he had the baseline chemical signature of what the subsidian looked like, so that when we found it elsewhere, he could say, yes, it was traded from the Mule Creek area. That's, that's his part of the work. My part of the work has been tracking it down in archaeological collections, um, which I think if you are really interested in, you can talk to me or uh, the, the cdark.org, our website has uh, things that I have written. I'm sorry in advance. Um, so he's telling me this story about going out to the Mule Mountain source, and I know where that is in the landscape, and he was telling me he had his daughter with him, and he, you know, he had not been able to contact this landowner, and he had been out there finally and decided he was just going to go out and pick up some rocks. Just had to hop a couple fences, you know, which is a scary business in that part of New Mexico. So he actually, uh, this is one of the few times in Shackley's career, shockingly, that he had actually sort of been shot at. Someone fired a gun 
near him. You know, not, not, you know, didn't fire it at him, but let him know, like, yeah, we know you're on our land and you should clear off. Well, so he had a sort of a bad, um, a bad taste left in his mouth in Mule Creek. So he's telling me where he is and, you know, the, the landscape. And this is, I, you know, I'd been out there a couple, three years at that point. And uh, turns out I had just a couple days before had iced tea with the guy that shot at him. <laughs> I mean, I know, I know that guy real well. And so, you know, it's, um, I, it had taken me a couple of years to meet this guy. And it had been part, you know, I would never, he would never have invited me into his home had I not already had the recommendation of some other people in the community. But that just, that just you know, to me, that was very instructive. You know, this guy had, as in our, in our couple year relationship, has yet to shoot at me. <laughs> but he he shot at Steve Shackley, and so that's that's the sort of thing. I mean, that guy's very protective of his land, and I know to this day, if I were out there and he didn't know who I was, he would probably shoot at me. But it, it just goes to show the that amount of time, you know, the amount of time that was necessary to get this guy comfortable with my presence, you know, made a big difference. And uh, you know, and I know the guy that shot at Steve Shackley. So. <laughs> yeah. I have a question concerning your um, the timeline issue and research funding. Mm -hmm. um, in, in NIH and the uh, that aspect of funding, we've as researchers, many of us have identified problems in the funding structure, haven't we all? Um, but there's almost a grassroots seeing that we as researchers are on the um, grant committees that uh, review grants. So why don't we look at ways in which we can expand? Um, how we look at funding so that we could include things that will allow the timeline to fit better. Do you know if um, on your side of it or people are looking at that saying, you know, when you're doing archaeological work, the funding timeline is not fitting to doing the, the type of work that's going to result in data that can be used for the databases you need? Um, well, I think that one of the problems with uh, and I think I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask Bill to talk about this here in just a second, but one of the problems is that it really takes persistent personnel in a community at, over a, a, a period of time. And so the structure of a lot of archaeological research that involves sort of a site or a chunk of the landscape, a question, the data to answer that question, the publication and you move on, isn't necessarily, that structure is not well suited. Unfortunately, a permanent or semi-permanent or long-term position where you can actually hire someone through funding, through, you know, whatever kind of funding structure you can set up, the money to actually keep someone in the community is prohibitively expensive. Um, we, we spend a lot of money and, and it isn't guaranteed, the results are not guaranteed. Right? That's a, that's a major problem. When you fund an NSF proposal, when the National Science Foundation funds a proposal, it is to do X amount of work. You, know, you go out, you do this, you, you, you pose an answer to a question that you have previously posed. The kind of work that, uh, that we have tried to do in, this, in these, these long-term community building exercises doesn't necessarily have the same kind of easily set up goals. It's harder to monitor. Um, I think that ultimately uh, the academy uh, is not well suited for that. And it falls to other kinds of organizations um, like the one I work, I work for, no, no bias, to try and fill those gaps. And so we've had some we've had uh, some cases of persistent personnel working in areas for a long time, and maybe Bill can can touch on that for a second. Just a, a brief comment: the we've intentionally structured ourselves with a geographic focus, a strong commitment to this uh, to the greater Southwest, but we're look, working on a much smaller scale than what our entire set of research interests involve. So by putting a string of different projects together, it's turned out to be the only way that we can fund an increment of National Science Foundation or National Endowment for the Humanities funded research. So we have to divide things up into little slices and work one step at a time. 
you always have to have an incredibly you know, innovative and creative new perspective in the next proposal. So that's the other challenge. You can't just say, well, I want to work here today and there tomorrow and, and another place the next day and do the same thing in each of those places. You have to create a, a strategy of innovation and uh, active uh, you know, commitment to moving things forward in, in a, on a big scale. And I think the real frustration, and this is where putting the, the underpinnings to our, our private side, is that we really can barely fund a quarter to maybe a third of a principal investigator's salary. So we really have to work hard to get that support to a principal investigator. Uh, we partnered with the National Trust for Historic Preservation. That's what allowed us to bring in Andy. Uh, and that was a three-year uh, cost share grant where we split those, those costs for the first three years. So getting diversity in your funding uh, stream, keeping uh, a wide range of, of partnerships uh, alive is, is a critical element. So let, there's a question up here in the front. I'm going to pass the, the baton on here. Okay. Thank you. I really applaud your emphasis on relationship. I've heard you speak of relationship in so many different ways since you both started talking. Mm -hmm. I think that's the answer to things. Right. I think people who own rural land, whether they own three acres or whether they're ranchers with thousands, have an attachment to their land that those of us who live in town can barely understand. I think when somebody comes, I've heard you say this, somebody comes and says, in effect, it gives them the impression that you're saying, hey, I'm from the government and I'm here to help you. It's no small wonder that they're a little bit concerned. Not a, not a big it, winner. <laughs> I, I know ranchers who have had somebody from the government come and find a plant or a fish or an owl or something on their land that has severely affected their personal economic structure. And it's no, no wonder to me that right. uh, some people think that you could do the same thing with a ruin. And mm -hmm. um, Absolutely. I'm not quite sure what my question is. I was just thinking about all of this <laughs> when you were talking relationship, and I don't see any other solution to overcoming this fear that people have because of the sometimes at least perceived exaggerated zealotry of environmental advocates you have to overcome that in order to develop a relationship that serves right. you. Can you, can you talk about that a little bit? I, I love it. Yeah. Well, you know, I, I think the interesting thing, and it, it also, I think, maybe reflects on the question you asked, is those relationships are best maintained, obviously, personally. You know, Rob, one-on-one, -on -one, myself. But on the other hand, there's also relationships that are maintained by the community, the preservation community. And I think, you know, while we probably can't deal with the timeline very effectively in a grant context, just because, you know, funding for long-term research, as you well know, is difficult in any environment. But there is things we can do, I think, to just improve that relationship. And I guess that's part of our message is that, you know, in the past, I think the archaeological community has had a reputation of kind of like parachuting into a community, exploiting yeah. the resource, and leaving. And not really leaving anything behind for the community. And, um, you know, I was just with a landowner last week, and I kind of chuckled to myself. We were talking about the sites on their property, which were very significant. And she was thinking about the long term, you know, what they're going to do with their ranch and blah, blah, blah. And I asked her, like, well, how much do you know about these sites? She goes, oh, well, you know, I've got this one thing from the researcher. And she kind of came out with this ASM, you know, anthropological series report. And even the way she handled it made me realize, like, she didn't really know what to do with it. She knew it was important. But God, I doubt she read any of it. So, you know, part of it is just like thinking about ways to maybe communicate in more basic ways mm -hmm. with landowners and yeah. le having leave behinds. Mm -hmm. We do presentations. We go to the, working with landowners. Rob and others have gone into the community at the post office and given a little slideshow. It's kind of thinking about that. I think that stuff, I'm sure some researchers are doing it. I don't mean to suggest they aren't. But more of that, I think, would be great. Basically, it said mm -hmm. we have to use X amount of this grant. 
to outreach to the community that right. applies what we're doing to that community. Mm -hmm. Perfect. And, and I think more of that needs to be done. Absolutely. If we don't make our research relevant, then we're not going to be supported by the overall community that sends their tax dollars to us to do research. Absolutely. And that's one of the things I just love about the, the dialogue that's happening with a lot of the soil and water conservation, yep. working with landowners, explaining to them the benefits of all of these things. Right. And I think when you do that, you start bringing communities that in the past have been very divisive into one body. Absolutely. Says, okay, we all have the same goal. That's right. Yeah, and you mentioned, you know, one of the prejudices that landowners have is as a result of the actions of some members of the environmental community. And I think that's where it gets back to this, what is, you know, how do those relationships get maintained, who maintains them, and I think to the extent to which the archaeological community can be embracing the things that you've just described, then when I come in the door, maybe it's not me they know, but they know the community I'm part of. Mm -hmm. And they have a good feeling about that community. Oh, that was a pleasant experience. Come sit down at my table, let's talk. As opposed to when you do work with the environmental community, which I did, and because it's been a mixed bag, it's a very difficult conversation to have. That's, a, that's actually an active conversation that we've been having. Uh, so I'm, I'm funded as a graduate student. I'm a preservation fellow. And presumably, one day very, very, very soon, I will be done with my dissertation. And then I will move on. You know, I will leave the center as, a, as a, a center employee. I will move on. Some of the relationships that I've built there in the Upper Gila had, you know, at least early on, been very much one-on-one -on -one personal relationships. And so we as an institution, as the center, had to, we had to sit down and have a conversation. How are we going to move this onus? This, how do we move the relationship, this trust relationship, from a one-on-one -on -one interpersonal relationship to a larger sort of the landowners trust the center and from there the landowners trust you know preservation archaeologists how do you have that conversation uh, because even in you know I'm a preservation fellow my job is to go out and do research while actively pursuing preservation archaeology but I have a very limited timeline and in, in an ideal world money would fall from the sky and allow me to work in the upper Gila for a very long time but you know that that kind of funding structure just doesn't exist um, to maintain these long-term relationships. I, well, I would love to. I think that'd be great. Yeah. Next question. Other comments, questions? Sarah. Um, you were talking about, um, at, at the beginning, you were talking about there being um, different kinds of risks in the San Pedro and in the Upper Gila, and I was kind of curious what the risks in the Upper Gila were. My long-term perception is pot hunting, but I didn't know if there were other development risks or subdivision risks. And I was also curious um, if the protections are different on the different sides of the um, state, or your preservation tools are different on the different sides of the state line. I can you want to talk about that? Um, on the risk side, it really, in, in the cliff uh, Gila area, it is still principally looting and vandalism, I would say. There's very li little development. There is some second home residential development, but I'd say, particularly in light of the current you know, economic uh, climate, it's, it's pretty nominal. So yeah, it continues to be looting and vandalism. And it's an ongoing enterprise there in that valley. The San Pedro you know, has a little bit of that, but I think you know, with the San Pedro, given its proximity to places like Phoenix and Tucson, I mean, it's just experienced more residential and commercial growth. So I think it's, it's not that big in like Tucson or Phoenix in the perimeters, but it is, it is different than the Cliff Valley in terms of the risks. So I think we have more of an immediacy, I would say, in the San Pedro, um, at least in terms of losing a site completely than we do in the Upper Gila. In terms of the laws, um, you know, I just learned about the New Mexico law. I was out this past week, um, and I actually saw a backhoe in a site, big site, and I got pretty upset about it, as you might imagine. And uh, so I went back all kind of, you know, we've got to do something about this. And uh, I called the New Mexico office. And the story's not over yet. But I learned that they have a Cultural Properties Preservation Act, which requires a permit if you're using heavy equipment in an archaeological site. And I thought, wonderful, I bet this guy doesn't have a permit. Well, there's a loophole. The loophole, though, is unless the operator of the equipment is working as an agent of the landowner. So it's like, 
what is this law for? And I guess the law is for if somebody's trespassing on your land with a bulldozer, you can get them. <laughs> Which at one time, I'm sure, was probably a problem. I don't think a that's a problem anymore. I think it's landowners using bulldozers themselves. So they have a law in New Mexico, but Arizona, I think really we rely on the federal law principally, right, Bill? I mean, on private land? NAGPRA, you know, North the Native American. There's that in the, I mean, the State Burial Act applies to private oh, property point. as well. Right. So, Yeah, and the Burial Act, of course, you have to actually uh, have evidence that they're digging up graves and the associated funerary objects, which, you know, you can certainly get that, but, you know, that's sort of a real-time kind of thing, and it's tough. It's just tough. Thanks, guys. Can, can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. Um, I was just wondering, uh, interested in preservation archaeology and how you prioritize those sites. And we don't have to get into the nuts and bolts because I'm sure this is a really long discussion. But you talked about research potential. And piggybacking off of Sarah's question about looted sites. Um, that's a, a, looted, a heavily looted site, especially in this area of the world is going to be probably a preservation priority, but at the same time, it may be damaged, so it's not as right. much of a research priority. You could right. go somewhere else with less damage. Right. And I was wondering how you think about looting, vandalism, being the priority risk in this area right. in prioritizing your sites. Yeah, no, that's a great question. I think uh, on the resource side, the priorities are pretty straightforward in terms of usually large habitation sites, you know, significant concentration of petroglyphs and the like. I think, though, on the threat side is really, really where we get into more of the nuts and bolts of the priority setting. And uh, it's first, after we have the expert workshop and we draw the lines on a map, we actually undertake a site condition assessment for as many of the sites as we can get access to. Else, again, some private landowners won't give us permission, and you can't see the site from a road, so we don't really assess those sites. But a lot of them we do get access to, and we actually rely on volunteers. Valerie's there in the right in front of you. She's helped us on a lot of sites in Pinal County. And so we go out and look at the sites to see when are they still there and what condition they are. So we rely on other people who have expertise to say, yeah, this site still has decent condition or boy, this site's really been hurt. And then we look at land ownership. Some of the stories I told before, obviously it's owned by the Nature Conservancy. That's a lower priority just because the chances are low that it's going to be impacted. Um, so we do factor in, I think, those risk factors. Um, it's always a tough call, though, um, and I just rely on the archaeologist since I'm not one. You know, at what point does a site become of insufficient value? And some of that is relative. What I've learned, and I'm sure Roger and you can speak to this, you know, the Members Valley has received some of the heaviest pressures because of the desirability of Members Pottery, and so your, your standard in terms of you know, what you're willing to accept as having research potential would vary. In the members, you might take sites that are maybe 80% destroyed, where in another place you'd say 80%, well, you know, there's plenty of other sites that are almost completely intact. So I think you know, it's a relative thing as well as some more straightforward objective criteria. We're starting to hear more and more about conflicts between cultural preservation folks and renewable energy development, particularly in the California desert. And I'm curious, given the increasing development of uh, both solar and wind projects in southwestern New Mexico and the transmission lines carrying those, those resources to Phoenix, if you've come across any conflicts in the areas where either of you have worked or how you see that playing out. Yeah, I, I can actually speak pretty directly to that. I've been participating in a public lands conference call at the National Trust for Historic Preservation, and they've been front and center on those conflicts you've just alluded to. We're very involved with a large transmission corridor project that's proposed between New Mexico and Arizona for renewables. And, uh, you know, I'm sure they have a di people have various takes on this, but I would say the principal issue relates to this requirement for consultation is part of Section 106. And what tribes want and insist upon and have been not getting very well is early and nation-to-nation uh, -nation consultation. And so I think what people in the preservation community might argue with respect to the issue you raise 
is that what's not happening is understanding where those resources are, traditional cultural properties in the case of Native Americans, in advance, so that we're not literally you know, in a conflict, right, because the project has been proposed in an area where with a little more advanced communication and planning may have been avoided. Now, sometimes you can't avoid it, but I think with, I, would, I would argue that with solar on public lands, there's lots of potential sites. And so if they did a lot more on the front end with understanding the traditional cultural properties through consultation with Native Americans, doing a better job at prehistoric cultural resource assessment, then maybe we can begin to set some areas off so that you know, the conflict would be avoided. Um, and I, the one other point I'll make is uh, what's, what's been hap what happens with Section 106 is that um, you know, the, the, the intent of the National Historic Preservation Act is principally to avoid impact. It really hasn't shaken out that way. I mean, sometimes it does, but a lot of times what it's turned out to be is, oh, we have impact, but we can mitigate it. And there's an easy mitigation strategy. It's called data salvage and recovery. And I, I would argue, and again, this is a personal comment, is that I think the ease of that mitigation strategy has diminished the uh, pressure to avoid. You know, it becomes a line item in a spreadsheet. And so what's happening on that solar, like for example, the, the transmission corridor project, we've been pushing to have consultation before they even select the alternatives. They won't do that. We're going to be invited to the table after they've selected the alternatives along with the preferred alternative. Well, we could still maybe avoid by tweaking and maybe what ultimately comes the preferred alternative, but we were involved much earlier. Maybe they wouldn't even create an alternative because we could point out how much important resources are in that path. They don't want to do it. They just don't want that level of process to intercede into the project. And it's a balancing act. There's timing issues. There's financial you know, issues, I'm sure. But that's, I think, the nature of the problem. And that's at least the cultural resource uh, side of the issue. Get at least one more question in here. I see a hand. Anyone? Andy and Rob, you've done a great job of uh, sharing the Preservation Archaeology mission.